That's not my slide. <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. Well, we'll start off. I'm Joe, and I'm a climber. I'm here to explain. No, oh, still back to the Lion King. I'm going to give this a minute. I sort of like my pictures. I'm here to explain why I and many of my friends aren't crazy. Why what I do is not abnormal. My entire life, people have treated me like, yeah, that's sort of OK. You're weird. I've been involved in sports that many people consider extreme. I really dislike that term. I'd call them adventurous at best. I've climbed rock. I've climbed ice. I've climbed on the Himalayas. I've climbed on overhanging rock in the Bandiagara Escarpment of West Africa. I climb. That's what I do. I've been a professional guide for 40 years. Ah, here we are, I think. <laughs> Just waiting. OK, going to go back up. I'm a conquistador of the useless, but I'm here to tell you why I'm normal. I started climbing in 1969, and I climbed with a group of friends, one of which, when I was 19 years old, I met and we went climbing in a place called Smuggler's Notch, Vermont, long, narrow ice gullies. We went to do a climb that was about 500 feet of mixed snow and ice. We would belay our way up. One of us would climb up, placing pieces of protection, anchoring systems along the way for 100, 125 feet, manipulate the rope for the next person up. They would come up, we'd get together, and one of us would lead the next section. Eventually, we got to the top of the climb. I led the last vertical ice section, which was quite exciting for me. When I got to the top, I went over to one side of the gully. There was a rock wall. I put some pitons in. Pitons, are, this is old school, were chrome, moly, alloy steel spikes that we'd stick into the rock, pound into the rock. And then I'd anchor myself to it with the rope that was attached to me, clip it in, and I'd manipulate the rope for my partner. He came up to me. And now above us was two or 300 feet of low to moderate angle snow. Well, we were. We were hot shoes, we were good climbers. So we decided we'd just climb this last section without having to belay each other. I took the equipment out of the wall. We started to climb up. Two or three steps into it, all of a sudden I had this very uncomfortable feeling. To this very day, I can close my eyes right now and I can see the diagonaling fracture line like lightning shooting left to right, diagonaling up and watching in being aware of my rate of acceleration, how what I was in was moving down. And the first four inches took longer than the next four inches, and I was actually aware of that. And then I was under the snow. I took my ice axe, which is also called a piole, P-I-O-L-E-T, pluralized with an S for anybody who plays Scrabble. It's in the Scrabble word dictionary. My wife says that's cheating, but it's a Scrabble word dictionary. And you take that and you put it diagonally across your chest and you press it into the snow underneath to stop yourself. It's called self-arrest. If you have to think about it, it's not going to work. It has to be instinctual. It has to be practiced. Eventually, I came to a stop. I decelerated. And the snow that was, I was enveloped in shed off me. I looked to my left. I didn't see my partner. I hadn't really thought about the fact that if, in fact, he had been pulled down off the rest of the climb, I would know soon enough. The tug on the rope pulling me over the climb would be enough. He was, I looked to my right, and he was about 10 feet from where the climb dropped off vertically. He was pretty badly hurt. Um, it was a bit of an epic to get him up, and it was a long, complicated descent to get him to the hospital. But we did it. We had to move fast. We had to move cautiously. 
my slides actually are sort of illustrate sort of my climbing career to some degree. They're not specifically um, based on the parts of the story I'm talking about. But sitting in the hospital, in the emergency room, it wasn't fear that was overwhelming at that, me at that point. It was, what had I done? How had I gotten myself into the situation? I had realized enough that the snow was unstable, but how did I even get myself into that position where I was standing in unstable snow without being properly attached? So that's more what I was thinking about. I have to go back to three years earlier. This same friend of mine who had taken me climbing, think carefully about your friends, asked me to go rock climbing when I was 16 years old. And having never done it, of course, if you're 16 years old, you say yes. I can't explain the level of terror I felt. 100 feet up a 900 foot cliff. I swore if I ever get out of here alive, I'll never do this again. I will never, I'll never climb again. I'll never drink, I'll never smoke. I'll become a priest, I won't have sex. I'll do anything if I just get out of here alive. After a couple hundred feet of climbing, we pretty much had used up all of our skills and we decided we'd have to repel back down. And when I got back down to the ground, fear wasn't the first emotion I felt. It was exhilaration, it was just pure exhilaration. So of course I went back and was gonna do it again. Now, I assumed he knew what he was doing. And I can tell you, as a guide for last month, I celebrated 40 years as a professional climbing guide. I've never had anybody more afraid of heights than I was that first day. That's why it sort of works very well for me being a guide because I can empathize, I understand the fear. I also, and this is a note to anybody who has a friend who's a great climber who's gonna take them climbing, look into their credentials a little bit. My friend, um, he was a good climber, so of course I was going to be safe. In retrospect, many of the things we did were wholly unsafe, and the fact that we got out of there was fairly remarkable. Now, what's the difference? If I was at home today, I live in Conway, New Hampshire, I would gladly go off and climb uh, one of the cliffs in my local area, either one that's 500 or 900 feet high, and I'd climb without a rope, without a second thought. My wife often encourages me to go out and just, just go solo something. Could be something else there, but I'm not sure. Well, the difference is my path of education. In high school, I was your classic A or F student. If I was engaged in a class, I got A's. School was very, very easy for me. If I wasn't engaged, I got F's. They kept telling me, oh, you have such potential. Why don't you try harder? So being, being me, in my junior year, I decided to live up my, to my potential. I walked into the principal's office and I said, see ya. I had heard about another school. I had heard about a school that had been founded a couple of years earlier in Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, it was called the Warehouse Cooperative School. It was a free school based on the work partially of um, the Summerhill School, but it was, a it was a school that encouraged and required an immense amount of personal control and personal motivation. The school was, well, first of all, I should say that my parents were Italian immigrants and me leaving a somewhat well-known high school to go to a weird alternative school really was way outside the norm for them. They were not going to be involved in this. I had to get a job and work nights, weekends, all summer long to pay my own tuition. To get into the school, I had to show that I had the self-motivation to be able to survive in the school, to thrive in the school. And because I was paying my own tuition, I was my own parent listed in the school. Not that my parents weren't loving, caring people, but this was way outside the norm for them. At the school, older students weren't required to do anything. You had to be self-motivated. You weren't graded. You had to be comfortable with your own level of satisfaction of what you were accomplishing in the school. Teachers would advertise their classes 
And we would have to go and look at the different classes, talk to the teachers, and then select what courses we wanted. And this was 100 kids, K through 12. If there wasn't a class that interested you, you could then go through our log of volunteer teachers, and um, you could then pick a professor, interview people. I took a philosophy class that way. Um, so in this class, I was also lucky enough to be involved in a um, evening class that involved graduate students from Harvard, and it was educational analysis. And it was there that I learned about a theory called the Pawn Origin Theory, which was expounded upon by Richard Descharmes from St. Louis University. In this, he states that we are all born as origins. We control everything that happens to us. As a child, you cry if you want food. But as life goes on, you are pushed towards the pawn side where life wants you to conform. It wants you to continue the path other people think you should, you should be subscribing to. Knowles Doherty, who is now Dr. Doherty, the founder of the school, when I talked to him last week for the first time in 40 years, said, well, you know, when you came into the school, you already had a full head of steam, which I did. But I have to say, if it wasn't for the nurturing, for the positive reinforcement, of what the school gave me, traditional school would have continued to try to push me back to make me normal, or their definition of normal. I wouldn't have got to travel the places I have around the world and do some of the things I've done because I have this attitude that I can do whatever I want. Upon graduation from the warehouse school, I went into full-time climbing mode. I climbed, I trained, I read, I studied. At one point, because I felt I was incredibly strong and I felt that was detrimental, I took three years of modern dance to improve my weight transfers over my feet to allow me to move more smoothly on the rock. It was never really pretty, but um, it really helped out. And it was that type of attitude that I isolated what I want to accomplish and I moved in that direction. That has allowed me to travel around the world and do the things I love to do. In my early 20s, I was also offered a job to be a professional climbing guide, to offered to be a, um, a job, which I never really knew if it would be, if I could share my passion and my profession. A couple of years into it, I realized this really works for me. And I've spent the last 40 years working to improve my guiding skills along with my climbing skills. They're very different. Climbing and guiding are very different types of jobs, but both of them fulfill the needs of my personal life. I picked up other interests in my life um, other than climbing, mountaineering, ice climbing, all types of climbing. I flew paragliders competitively for a number of years. And I approached it the same way I approached climbing. It wasn't a matter of fear. You know, this is exciting. I looked at it. I studied aerodynamics. I studied weather. I studied um, anything I could that had to do with aviation and then got very involved in flying competitively. We would fly courses during competitions that were anywhere from 10 to 100 miles long, where we'd have to launch our paragliders, catch thermals, ride the thermals up, jump over to the next one. We'd be flying for hours at a time. I also am part of a technical rescue squad that does above tree line um, rescue work, mostly in northern New Hampshire. Um, up in the White Mountains. But it's that same type of we are, we are given a responsibility, we are given a this is where somebody is, um, you need to try to get to them. And it's that same sort of I can do this, I, here are the skills I need. A lot of my close personal friends who are climbers and also professionals, not everybody's taken the path I have because that's the path I took. 
I decided to be a professional climbing guide, and that's how I'd make my living. But I have many friends who have, are just as serious a climber, but also have other professions, but also my close personal friends all have the same attributes of control of their own destiny. I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't gone to this school that empowered me, that gave me the ability to say, there is no norm I need to subscribe to. I can make the decision about what is normal and what isn't normal for me. So I can tell you that being in control of my own destiny has allowed me a path that I really have nothing but thanks for the teachers in the environment that said to me, hey, whatever you want can be yours as proof to the fact that, which I said here at the beginning, that I'm normal, I have this proof, which is out of the New World Dictionary. Obviously, this is a real picture of the word normal, and it is a picture of me. Um, I, I, I took this out of the book. It's all too easy to let life carry you along, to let others determine what you should be in the, to define the definition of success and happiness. It's up to you to make those decisions. Thank you very much.